Oh, that's a lot of water everywhere. That's not how boilers work. As one of my patrons said, this is why boilermakers have their own drink. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. Whew. Today's the day, Blondie Hacks fans. It's been a long time coming, but today is the day we pressure test the Pennsylvania A3 switcher boiler. This is the end result of a huge, huge amount of work. Probably more than 200 hours have gone into this boiler. And if it fails this pressure test today, the whole thing might be scrap. If it fails a little bit, we can probably fix it. If it fails a lot, it may not be fixable. We won't know until we put the pressure gauge on it and we start pumping it full of water. Well, I gotta tell you, I've honestly been losing sleep over this legitimately for the past few days. Uh, but today is the day we're gonna find out if this boiler is any good or not. So let's go. <laughs> to get ready for the pressure test, I'm gonna chase all the threads on all the fittings. This is months of pickling and torch soot and so on that has accumulated on everything. So give everything a good clean here just to make sure I can get good seals on all the fittings. I need to be able to block everything up. Well, not everything. I started by blocking these front two tubes just on autopilot, not really thinking about it. But of course, those front two don't need blocking. One is the blower pipe, which goes all the way through the boiler. The other one is the steam pipe, which opens up into the steam dome base, which is itself blocked. So that was a waste of time. But anyway, I blocked all of the lower fittings and I'm just testing for water tightness now. I'm pretty sure it won't be because I'm pretty sure I damaged the foundation ring. And yes, sure enough, I did. You might recall when I did the stay bolts, I was 90% sure I had damaged the foundation ring in that corner. And well, that is confirmed. It's drip, drip, dripping everywhere. So I can drain this out now and get ready to repair that leak. No sense trying to do a pressure test if it doesn't even hold water. Now begins the routine that I'll be doing a lot, which is removing all the fittings, pickling, and getting ready for solder. And then after soldering, pickle it again, reinstall all the fittings, start filling it with water, etc. Each iteration of a leak fix takes about an hour because of all of these different steps. It's very time consuming. After pickling, I stuff the firebox full of ceramic wool there to protect everything inside from the torch while I do this corner here. A little bit of solder and flux on the corner there where it's leaking. And then I just heat up this area until that solder flows. Now the question is, will doing this damage other joints in that area? You don't really know, it's hard to say. Sometimes all you can do is, well, point the torch and hope that nothing bad happens. There are some techniques you can use to minimize damage, which I'll be showing here in a moment. But uh, for now, I'm just kind of taking my chances. It takes about 20 minutes to cool after each one of those repairs. And then pickle it and clean it up. And let's try again. So I've got it flipped over here and I'm once again filling it up with water. And this time I had a huge leak, which uh, turned out to be the drain plug. So yeah, I should probably have put that back in first. That's definitely going to skew the results of any pressure test. So I got to drain that out again and put the plug in and let's try that again. My strategy here is to bring the water level up a little bit at a time so I can check each area of the boiler for water tightness as I go. That way, if something leaks, I can easily identify which area, which seam, you know, which bushing at which height is leaking. If you just fill the whole thing up all at once, if you've got a bunch of leaks, there's just going to be water running out of everywhere, and it's going to be hard to tell where it's all coming from. The next leak then was coming from one of the stay bolts inside the firebox. That was also not watertight, so I've got to fix that next. So tear it all down once again, and I'm going to set it up for soldering. This time I'm using heat shields on all four sides of the foundation ring. This is an extension of the technique that Kozo recommends for soldering the stay bolts initially. This time I'm supersizing that, if you will, and spoiler alert, this seems to work quite well. So I wish I had done more of this sooner. There's really no reason not to. This heat shielding actually works really well. It does not prevent the boiler from getting hot like ceramic wool would, and it doesn't keep the heat in, potentially damaging adjacent joints the way that ceramic wool does, but it keeps the torch flame from directly impacting those joints, and I think that's what really causes the damage. I've also gone down one tip size on the torch here for this operation because getting the flame inside the firebox there, things get really, really hot in there because it's, well, a firebox and thus contains the fire very effectively. It doesn't take nearly as much heat to get the whole area hot, so smaller torch tip is fine there. 
cool and pickle once again. Now I've got it filled up partially with water, this time standing on end. Again, bringing the water level up a little at a time. It looks like all the stay bolts are watertight now. Foundation rings all watertight, so that repair seems to have succeeded and everything's looking good there. So I'm going to bring the water level up a little higher now. If I reach one of the open fittings there, like the steam dome base, then I'll start adding fittings and continuing. But once again, I didn't get that far. The outer crown sheet is pouring water out of there. This is definitely another joint that I damaged somewhere along the way because I know for a fact right after I made that joint that there was a very visible solid silver solder fillet all the way around that joint. So somewhere along the way I must have overheated that area. This should be a pretty easy fix though. It's an easily accessible joint and not a lot of risk of damage here. My strategy is I'm heating the sheet metal on either side of the joint, not the solder directly. I'm trying to keep the torch away from the solder itself with the intention of making sure that the metal is what melts the solder and not the torch flame. That's how you make sure you get a good solder joint. After that repair, things are finally watertight. So, one milestone down. Let's start actually building pressure now. You can see I've got all the fittings in there except for one to let air out. Then I can fill the boiler all the way up. Well, almost all the way up. The manifold bushing at the rear is intentionally the high spot. I've arranged it thusly so that I can bring the water level up to the level of the fill bushing, then install the pressure gauge, and then resume adding water, and there should be no air left in the system then. Then I top up the water level to the high point there just using the hand pump itself. Very carefully, I want to make sure not to spill any water here because that'll make it really hard to tell if there's leaks. You want to keep the boiler dry as much as possible. Once full of water, I can install the final plug, and now we can start building pressure. Here goes nothing. And immediately, I've got a leak on the outer crown sheet again. There she blows! Yes, hilariously, water is shooting out the top of that. So clearly my repair to the outer crown sheet joint there didn't work. So I went ahead and did it again, just like you saw there earlier. And now here we are back again for a second attempt. Sometimes it takes two tries to fix a joint. Now we're building pressure. That's looking good. So I'm going to go up to 50 PSI. The goal is 200 and yeah, well, now all of my blinking plugs are leaking because I got lazy and I left them in while I did that last repair. And of course the heat ruined the Loctite. With that fixed, take two. Let's try that again. Now we're at 50 PSI and we can start checking for leaks. At 50 PSI now, I'm getting a leak from somewhere underneath the firebox. I've got water dripping down on my tray there. I keep the tray dry so I can see fresh water, but I can't quite tell where it's coming from. This is the tricky part. A lot of people suggest using some sort of dye for this, but that doesn't really solve any problems. It's not hard to tell you've got a leak. The water is easy to see. It's hard to tell exactly where the leak is coming from, and the dye doesn't help with that. It just means that the whole area would be covered in green water instead of regular water. In this case though, I identified that it was definitely coming from the other corner of the foundation ring, the opposite corner from the one I fixed. So this one was also leaking, just not as badly, so it was watertight but not pressure tight. I shielded the rest of the foundation ring there with some sheet metal and fixed that, and that seemed to go well. So now I'm back up to 50 PSI again. The next leak then was coming from another one of the stay bolts. So at 50 PSI, this other one was leaking near the other one that I fixed. Pretty sure those were both just not great joints from the start. I don't think that's damage. With that repaired, I can now get up to 100 PSI. So this seems to be holding well. It's bleeding down a little bit, but I can't quite tell from where. Seems okay though, so I'm going to go up to 150 PSI. Sometimes if you can't tell where a leak is coming from, just go a little higher on the pressure and the leaks will get more obvious. At 150, the steam dome base blanking plug there let go. The gasket in it there is not good enough. It's a paper gasket, which those work fine, except that they don't reuse very well. And I need something that I can use over and over again for these tests. I decided to take that apart and I replaced it with a soft rubber gasket from some sheet stock that I have. And I had to make longer bolts, of course. Nothing's ever so simple. And then I bolted that back on and this should allow me to get a much better seal and I can reuse this gasket for test after test. If you're wondering what an actual blowout looks like on a test like this, I'll show you. Here I am pumping it back up to 150 after installing the blanking plug and look at this here. Sploot! See that little fountain of water that shot out the side there? That's what happens if something fails somewhat catastrophically. And this is why we hydro test. 
If this had been air pressure at 150 and a blowout like that happened, that could very well have been an explosion. So don't mess around with air pressure. All right, with that blanking plug nice and tight now, I managed to get it up to 175 PSI. And things are looking good. It is still bleeding down a little bit. I got something leaking down here on this corner, but I can't tell where it's from. So I'm going to go up to 200 again, so it'll get more obvious. Took me a while to find this one, but here it is, way down in the corner. That little brass fixturing screw. It's a little drip that forms right there, about every 10 seconds or so. Little tiny drip forms there at 200 PSI. So that's the next leak. That should be easy to fix, or at least so naive past me thought. Here's my setup for that. I've got sheet metal to protect the stay bolts there, and I aimed the torch kind of at the corner there. A little drop of solder on the fixturing screw, and I just needed to flow that solder to kind of caulk the area over top of the screw. Now this was going wrong, but I didn't actually notice at the time. On the video here, you can see the solder flowing in the joint below that repair there. More on that in a minute. So I pumped that back up to 200 PSI after that repair, and I had damaged the foundation ring in two places repairing that little weeping corner. Yes, two places. So I set it up like this again and repaired those two corners of the foundation ring once again. This is always the fear with a boiler is that you'll damage old joints and it can turn into two steps back, one step forward. Back up to 200 PSI now. The foundation ring seems to be holding. Something else is leaking though. Looks like maybe the steam dome base. I optimistically tightened the blanking plug there, hoping it was the gasket again, but no. Can't deny it, it's definitely the joint this time. And uh, yeah, remember this little joint? Let's flash back to right after I silver soldered the steam dome base. I suspected this joint wasn't great because you can kind of see how it's a bit of a mess. Well, this is now leaking. Interestingly, this joint passed the barrel pressure test that I did, but it failed this one. So possibly that joint wasn't very good and it got weakened by all of the operations I've been doing. Or who knows, for whatever reason, it's now failing a pressure test when it didn't before. So got to fix it. In a situation like this where there's a bunch of excess solder in the area, it's a good idea to remove it first before attempting a repair because just blobbing solder on top of solder on top of solder is never going to result in very good joints. So whenever practical, you want to grind away all the old silver solder in the area first. So I do this as much as I can, making sure not to touch the copper or the bushing itself because you don't want to remove any material there. You just want to remove the solder. So I get rid of the worst of it with the rotary tool and then I did some needle filing as well. Quick easy repair there, and I'm back up to 200, but something is still seeping down, and I'm still getting a little drip somewhere, I think, down below the firebox. And I started to get suspicious of, you guessed it, that fixturing screw still leaking. You will note the solder next to the screw, which is, I think, very decorative, really ties the room together, but didn't do anything to fix the leak because I missed. Now, I hemmed and hawed about what to do about this problem for quite a while. I tried mechanically staking it, which did help a little bit, and I considered leaving it. It wasn't really that bad, and then I slept on it, and then I ran out of excuses for not doing the right thing, and I put it back under the torch. I was really scared to try fixing this again because I damaged the foundation ring in two places the last time I tried, but I've got a better setup, I think, this time. You can see I've got sheet metal protecting the foundation ring in every place that might be near the torch and the stay bolts as well, and I've got a better angle that isn't going to impact the foundation ring directly. So this seemed to go okay. You can see how much work the sheet metal is doing there to protect everything from the torch. I got that solder to flow, and I was very careful to make sure I actually got the right spot this time. No obvious signs of damage there, and I think I got the right spot, so I'll let that cool down, pickle, and inspect once again. And this time, back up to 200 PSI, and it's bone dry. That seems to be a good repair, along with the decorative blob of solder that I think really ties the room together. At this point, the pressure's holding really well. I'm looking and looking and looking, and I cannot find any more wet spots. This thing is just bone dry all over the place. The goal is to hold two times working pressure for 15 minutes. So that is what I'm doing, inspecting as I go. But here we are at 15 minutes, and it's still holding 200 PSI. Now, it has lost a couple of pounds, so that could mean there's still a leak, so I'm checking just to make sure. But after a lot of lot of inspecting, 
I could not find any leaks. So what I believe is happening is the few pounds that it's losing is coming from my pump fixture here. This plumbing up here is definitely not perfect. I know for a fact this check valve does not hold 200 PSI perfectly. So I added a globe valve in front of that and I close the globe valve once I'm up to pressure. But I know for a fact that model globe valves also don't seal perfectly, certainly not at 200 PSI. So there's moisture around there, so I know things are seeping there, and it's perfectly reasonable to assume that that's where the pressure drop is, since I can't find any other leaks. At this point, I had to decide whether it was worth rebuilding all of my plumbing with all new components, perhaps commercial stuff that's going to seal better, and try to aim for a perfect, perfect test. But since I couldn't find any leaks anywhere, what I actually did is talk to the model engineering club where I hope to eventually run this locomotive because they're the ones that need to certify this boiler. Told them all everything that was happening and they said that as is, this boiler is going to pass their certification with flying colors. So there really wasn't any point in trying to go further with it. So we're calling this a win. This boiler has passed a 200 PSI pressure test and we can tear it down and uh, take the win. As always, to bleed down the pressure, I'm loosening the fill plug there gently. Just let that pressure drain down slowly. Don't want to rush it. There's no value in shocking the system here. One pro tip, even when that needle is on the peg reading zero, continue to wait because there's still a few pounds left in that boiler. Pressure gauges don't read accurately at very low pressures. And if you get a little hasty pulling that plug out, it'll pop out of there like a champagne cork, driving it up into the ceiling or your face, whichever comes first. They're never going to call me Old Quinn One-Eye because I've got eye protection on, but I don't want to be called Old Quinn Gap-Tooth either. If you need to hit pause and go powder your nose right now, I understand. I'll wait. Overall then, how did this go? Let's run down the list of leaks that I had to fix. The foundation ring left rear was leaking initially, and I had to fix that twice because I damaged it. Foundation ring right rear, also leaking initially, and had to be fixed a second time. The outer crown sheet was not watertight initially, and it took me two tries to fix that to make it pressure tight. Stay bolt number four was not watertight, and I didn't show you, but I actually took two tries to fix that as well. Stay bolt number six was not pressure tight. That was an easy fix. And then, of course, the fixturing screw, including the decorative solder blob, which I think really ties the room together, was two more fixes. And finally, the steam dome base bringing the total to 9 leaks over 12 heatings. That's actually pretty decent for me. That's kind of in the middle of my history. This is my fourth boiler build. The second one I ever built ended on the bandsaw because it had the dreaded downward spiral, wherein every leak that I fixed created one or two more, and I was never able to get ahead of it. And the bottom line was there was just too many joints that were not really fixable from the outside, and the whole boiler had to be scrapped. That was pretty heartbreaking. Boiler number three passed a pressure test on the first try. It was flawless, and to this day, it's one of the best things I've ever made. So I didn't expect to get quite that good on this one, considering the incredible complexity step up that a locomotive boiler is. All my previous boilers have been basic cylindrical stationary boilers. And I think the reason for my relative success here with this boiler is honestly the experience gained from that. If you're considering building a locomotive boiler, I cannot stress enough, you definitely want to build I would say at least two or three simple stationary boilers before you attempt a locomotive. You really want to get the feel of silver soldering, learn what a good joint looks like, what a bad joint looks like, understand how to manage the heat and the flux and the pickling and everything, because all those little details are just so important. Locomotives have lots of challenging things to make. There's the valve gear and lubricators and water pumps and all sorts of things. What sets the boiler apart though is that it's all or nothing. If you make a mistake on the valve gear, just make one or two parts again, whatever you need to do, and you can recover and keep going. You can't do that with the boiler. It's a whole bunch of parts and a very complex assembly, and 100% of it has to be perfect. And if it isn't, you have to do it all over again. So that's why the boiler is such an intimidating thing, and also why I made it first, because honestly, if this had been a catastrophic failure, I don't know that I would have continued with this project. Or at the very least, I would have taken a long break to recover emotionally from that experience. As I said, I've been through a boiler disaster before, and I was not ready for that to happen again. But luckily, this boiler is a huge success. Now look, pressure tests are all well and good, but this boiler isn't done until it passes the QC inspector. This is the real test. Looking good, looking good. Union break, and resume inspection. 
And well, what's that over there? No, nope, looking good, looking good. And the result is general disdain. That's the highest form of cat praise. So grand success. Final boiler weighs eight pounds. It actually seems heavier than that, but scales don't lie unless I'm standing on them. And I used 20 pounds of propane just about exactly. I do still have to get it certified by the club, and I'll let you know when that happens, assuming it passes. But in the meantime, here's the final boiler. I'm really very proud of it. I could not be happier with how this went. The leak fixing stage was very anxiety inducing. I was always worried that it was going to spiral downward, but I managed to stay ahead of the leaks and make progress. And well, here we are. What's next then? Well, let's go back to the big book here. Let's see. Build one boiler. Check. All right, let's build a locomotive. Thank you very much for watching, and thanks to my patrons who've really supported me throughout this whole process, financially and emotionally, not gonna lie, and I will see you next time.